Hello everyone and welcome to Solar System Colonization in Kerbal Space Program 1.0.4 with Realism Overhaul. This series will be different from any I've done before in many ways. First, what you'll be seeing will be from Twitch live streams I will do on Sundays, but what you'll be hearing will be post-commentary, not the original audio. That's because the live streams contain music that's not safe for YouTube, and also because I want to edit the 5-6 to six hour live streams down to half an hour, which would be difficult if I used my original commentary. The other main difference between this and any other series I've done is that this will be Realism Overhaul Sandbox. Until now, the only full Realism Overhaul series I've done have been in Career Mode. Actually, what you'll see here is that I select Science Mode, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to give myself a whole bunch of science up front, and I'm going to unlock all the sciences so that I have all the parts, and then I'm going to zero out the science again so that we can do science. I just want to be able to do science even though it's Sandbox Mode, so that's why I'm doing it this way. So that's what you see me doing here. The launchers for the series have already been built. This is a shuttle I developed on my live streams that we will be using, but otherwise we'll be using real launchers, for instance Falcon 9 and the SLS. So here is Last Tech's uh, Falcon 9 with the Dragon 2 at the top. And so we'll be having real launchers except for the shuttle that I developed during my Twitch live streams. Our first mission will be to launch communication satellites because of course we have remote tech, so we need to set up a communications array uh, so that we can control our vessels and uh, to do that we're going to launch four satellites on a single Falcon 9 launch uh, that was suggested by an audience member that I put four satellites on and so here you see me crafting those satellites for now these do not have antennae that are meant for interplanetary missions these are small satellites just for control in earth and lunar space and that's what you see me trying to work on here a little 2 kN thrusters using MMH and N204. I eventually make the body bigger. And actually it's overdoing it on the fuel as we'll eventually see. Well, not exactly. You see how I'm copying the, the initial probe I made and duplicating it? Well, that turns out to be not a good way to keep the fuel in. And uh, little did I know that the lower three probes are, are not fueled right now. It's only the top probe that actually has fuel. Well, anyway, uh, that's a little bit of uh, a spoiler there, but uh, here, uh, the, the fairing is sized correctly to the SpaceX fairing. I already tweaked it and all, and it's a set fairing size, and so I couldn't use the last tech fairing because there's something wrong with the, with the attachment nodes. Here you see me selecting Brownsville as our launch location because that is... Uh, new SpaceX facility they're building there and I didn't want to launch from Cape Canaveral. Now one of the flaws in not having the original audio is that I don't have the launch audio, I don't have the engine audio, so that's a downside to this. The upside is that you don't have to sit through six hours. Actually it was a six and a half hour live stream, so yeah, that's a plus. Now when it comes to recovering the first stage of the Falcon 9, I do want to try that, but not if I'm focused on my payload. Right now that's a different sort of test. I need FMRS in, I don't have that in this install, and I'm not too sure it worked properly. Uh, right now I do have stage recovery, and so what you'll see me do is I'm going to reserve some fuel in the first stage. It's got its lander legs and grid fins. I'm going to see whether that's going to work out for us and whether stage recovery will recover it. And uh, so that's what I'm testing here. Uh, I know from previous tests that if I was going to land it back at Cape Canaveral, I'd need about 1,400 meters per second. I assume that stage recovery would use less, but as it turns out, I don't think stage recovery bothered to read the first stage at all, so I still have a little bit of trouble working with stage recovery in real solar systems. Sometimes it works, some installs it doesn't. Anyway, here we are on the second stage. This is a very long burn and fairing separation. The whole video is sped up, by the way. Initially, the video is sped up by about 4x, and uh, at this point, we're more like at about 2x and so I've been trying to match real time but in reality the launches took a lot longer of course and uh, but it was alright since we had good music here we go for orbit and I'm gonna continue burning here uh, and that's because I'm just gonna use this fuel to get us out to initially I intended to go to semi-synchronous orbit but ultimately we'll be putting it into geosynchronous orbit these probes had more than enough fuel there was more than enough fuel all around to manage that so actually of course only the top one will get to geosynchronous on this launch because the other ones don't have fuel but I still don't know that 
Anyway, here we go. Second stage cutout. High G-forces. I forget if the second stage has throttling or not. Somebody in chat mentioned that it did, but I'm still not sure. I haven't checked that yet. Anyway, here we go. Uh, the top probe. I'm getting the stuff active to make sure that it stays in communication. I had tried to remove that decoupler on the top, which I used as the root part to try and duplicate the probe, but of course that didn't decouple, it was the wrong way around. Okay, here we go, we're going to apoapsis. At first I'm going to get it into semi-synchronous, so a 12-hour orbit, and then we'll work from there. Okay, engine slit, the uh, two kilonewton thrusters, bringing us up to basically circularize this orbit. We're already at the correct apoapsis. Here's the view from high up, approaching a 12-hour orbit, and we'll use RCS to back off from that. Just two minutes off. Well, actually, it's actually four minutes off. But anyway, this is a temporary orbit. I decide that, uh, based on what uh, chat advised, that we would go for a geosynchronous orbit. And here I am readying the second probe, which I still don't know does not have fuel in. Partly, probably because I had the resources hidden right there. But now you can see there there's no MMH and N204 in these, but I didn't notice that just yet. I only notice when I separate the probe. Here we go. And try and use the RCS thrusters to pull myself away from the rest of the stack. And that didn't work. And right clicking on the tank, I see there's no fuel. And so this launch is a bust. I decide to get the first probe into geosynchronous orbit. So here I am boosting the apoapsis and then I'll circularize at apoapsis, bringing the periapsis up. And we're covering the Pacific Ocean with this probe, you can see. So it'll be in communication with the West Coast uh, mission control centers, but uh, covering uh, the wide expanse of the Pacific Ocean where we'll otherwise often you lose connection. So it's a good place to put it. Worth remembering, of course, that if you want to keep it at the same spot around the Earth, you need to go for 23 hours, 56 minutes, and about 4 seconds. That's where I put it anyway. Okay, back in the VAB, I decided to make some edits. And the recommendation from the audience was that we should uh, go for some lunar satellites. And initially, I decided to have one geosynchronous satellite and two lunar satellites. And resizing them, making sure that the fuel is in first, of course. And so here you see one geosynchronous at the top and then two lunar satellites at the bottom. But uh, reassessing the delta-v situation and assigning, since uh, stage recovery didn't recover the first stage anyway, we would continue using the first stage and burn out all of its fuel, I decided that there was room for a third lunar satellite. And so here you see the stack with three lunar satellites and one geosynchronous satellite, and that became the new plan, again on Falcon 9. By the way, this isn't Falcon 9 with upgraded engines, so this Falcon 9 actually has much less of a payload capacity than the real one. Okay, here we go, launching again from Brownsville. This is a nighttime launch because we wanted to match inclinations with the moon as much as possible so I didn't have to do any off-plane transfer or some weird plane change. Uh, still 2.7 degrees off. Now, uh, I do have Planet Shine in, but it doesn't do below 2 kilometers altitude very well. And so I do have uh, movie time to give us night view, night vision, temporarily until we get to a higher altitude, at which point Planet Shine just, uh, does just fine. So you see that here. Again, video sped up uh, to try and match real time. Now this time I'm not even pretending to recover the first stage, so we'll let it burn out and that'll give us an extra kick. And then the second stage will have fuel to start us out on translunar injection about halfway. And the geosynchronous satellite will just uh, sort of uh, fix itself up uh, using the initial portion of the translunar injection. The lunar satellites will just continue burning through translunar injection and head on to the moon. Anyway, here we have first stage separation and the second stage is lit. Uh, sorry, the plume is in the wrong place. I'll have to try and figure out how to move the plume. There's fairing separation. And here I am testing whether I can just continue burning the second stage uh, straight through to the moon, or through 
halfway through uh, translunar injection if this trajectory is fine because I noticed the moon seemed to be in a pretty good place and it was so uh, we will just continue burning the stage we won't have to relight it the second stage of Falcon 9 can relight but I don't have to in this case so that's good alright and uh, here we go passing over Florida well uh, passing over the Gulf of Mexico approaching Florida I should say and there you see the Bahamas over there we were pretty much right over Florida when we made orbit and there is orbit and we continue burning for the moon still with a two degree inclination but that's alright the moon has a sufficient sphere of influence and gravity to pull us in with that inclination there okay waiting for a second stage burnout with the g-forces getting high again so seven seconds Okay, second stage is out, and our geosynchronous satellite is separated. So we're going to continue boosting this up. It isn't at the proper apoapsis yet. The target apoapsis is 35,786 kilometers. And so we're just going to continue burning. And it probably won't have to do too much to get to its target apoapsis. And then we will schedule the burn at apoapsis with a Kerbal Alarm Clock in order to circularize but uh, we'll want to transfer the lunar satellites before doing that. So while this is on its way to apoapsis, we'll transfer the lunar satellites. So that's the plan. Here we go. We're uh, close enough to target apoapsis. Uh, use RCS to nudge it forward a little bit. Plot up its circularization. And uh, hopefully that'll get us to a good location. If it doesn't, I'll skip circularization there and have it go around again. Okay. So it's scheduled and we've got the second satellite, this one aimed for the moon. And so here you see me tweaking the lunar transit. It doesn't have to be very close to the moon, of course. We want it high over the moon. We don't want it tight on the moon. So uh, yeah, I keep it loose. Uh, not that it was very easy to get it very close to the moon with that two degree incl inclination anyway. But uh, here is the rest of translunar injection for this probe, this satellite. And I make sure to tune the antennae to earth and also to active vessel which will be very useful so that's what all of these satellites will be tuned to here we go rounding out that burn making minor adjustments at about 8,000 kilometers above the moon it's gonna be set at and that alarm is in for SOI change second lunar satellite question is whether I can start its burn immediately and it turns out no it's too far off from the periapsis to start it immediately so we go around we go once around in our orbit with the two other satellites moving forward and now engines are lit the two kilonewton thrusters and it's going to complete its translunar injection with relative ease there's a uh, Baja wow, California, Gulf of California and Mexico there. We are very close to the end of translunar injection, so we'll just wait for the probe to round itself out. You can still see more than 2,000 meters per second of delta V in these probes. Uh, plenty of spare room, actually, to, for instance, change their situation around the moon if it turns out that one of our missions requires it, or uh, adjust its inclination and stuff like that. So, yeah, plenty to work with here. All right, anyway, it's on its way. And finally, the last probe still seems to be in a good spot. So we'll start its translunar injection right away. That does leave the second stage of the Falcon 9 in orbit around Earth. So that's not exactly the best situation. But uh, I haven't added the decaying or uh, orbital decay mod yet, but maybe that's the thing we should do. By the way, if you're wondering about the model list, that should be in the video description. And here we see our final lunar commsat coming close to the end of translunar injection. Coming close to uh, Central America over there. Okay, there we go. About the same periapsis as you might expect with the same inclination. So we get to that and uh, 
First thing to do, though, is to get our geosynchronous satellite rounded out, get it circularized at 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. So here we go for that. And actually, it's got less margin than the lunar satellites, ironically. But of course, it's smaller. So here we go, boosting up. And as you can see, this is going to end up over Africa. Uh, we do have a communication station in South Africa. So this is partially helpful with the South Atlantic and the Indian Ocean there. But probably not the best place. I would like it squarely above the Indian Ocean a bit because I often lose connection as we approach Australia. We have a communication station at South Africa and another in Australia, but nothing in between. So that would have been a little bit better. Maybe I'll reposition this some other time to uh, get it over there. But for now, we leave it here. And so that's two satellites, geosynchronous satellites around the Earth. And now we're taking care of our lunar satellites. So this one makes its approach, entering lunar SOI. First entry into lunar SOI in this series. So here we go. As you can see, this one ends up in a polar trajectory. I like the other two to be more equatorial, though, uh, so that's going to be a thing. But this one, we're, we're going to keep polar, and so I'll just do a retroburn at periapsis. If I can figure out which handle to pull. There, there we go. Okay, and that's all scheduled. And it turns out that's going to happen first before any of the other probes enter. So here we are at periapsis, very high, 8,000 kilometers or so, and we light the engines to get into orbit. Okay, this is the conclusion of that burn, and for no reason in particular I decided to go with the same orbital period we have for the geosynchronous satellites. It's completely meaningless around the moon, of course, but I still go ahead and go for 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. Um, go figure. That's that's just how it is. Okay, so uh, here we are with the next satellite. And this time I am going to correct the inclination. Uh, bring it more equatorial. Not necessarily flat, but uh, something with minimal inclination. We'll put the final satellite at some angle to it. Not 180, because then they won't be able to talk to each other without the polar satellite, but like 90 to 135 or something like that. Anyway, uh, here I've plotted for the orbital burn and scheduled it, but our next satellite is coming in before that, so I have to switch to it, correct its inclination first. And this doesn't have to be particularly precise, of course. Um, which inclination I choose is arbitrary and also what periapsis I choose is arbitrary because we want to have it different from the other one. The only thing is I want it to be different from the other one. That's the only requirement. Anyway, so here is that correction being done and the orbital burn being plotted and scheduled. Okay, and so that means that the other one goes first and here is the orbital burn for this one, plenty of fuel remaining for any other corrections we might want to do. And it's so high up that inclination corrections will be easy. Uh, of course, uh, if we want to rephase it so that it ends up in a different uh, angle to the other two, we can do that as well. It ends up at an inclination of about 21 degrees. And again, I put it in the same orbital period because why not? As I round this one off with RCS here, uh, we will switch directly to the other vessel using Kerb Alarm Clock. I've heard that that could cause glitches, but I haven't seen it so far. Just a reminder, we are in OpenGL mode with forced anti-aliasing, so again, that is how I'm uh, fitting as many mods as I am in this. Um, and yeah, it, it ran pretty well. There was only one crash during a six and a half hour stream, so I think that's very good. Here you see that the angle is not very good between the two satellites, so I decided to phase it a little bit and make sure that we get some gap between them. Here I do a burn at apoapsis to correct the periapsis, and then I'll let it go around a little bit more, and there you see the angle between them as we approach periapsis with this satellite and bring that orbit down to the same orbital period.
I guess I picked that orbital period because it was just easy to remember. Of course, any whole number would have done. Okay. So, a little bit of RCS there. And this is what our constellation looks like. Three satellites around the moon, two around the Earth, and of course all those ground stations that have humongous range to work with. Anyway, back to the Space Center. Okay, so the next thing I want to do, we're not just going to put communication satellites up. No, I want to test out this station. And you can see the centrifuge from the Habitat Pack. And I have the mod Keep Fit. Uh, so we actually need to keep our Kerbals fit during long journeys. That's going to be very important when we try and colonize places. So that's very complicated. I don't know if Keep Fit works properly with Realism Overhaul though. And so I'm going to launch a low Earth orbit station to test out whether everything works to sort of simulate basically what the ISS is supposed to do, except we're actually going to be having artificial gravity and exercise and all that. Technically, we don't need this centrifuge to spin as quickly as it does. We only need a little bit of gravity to help them exercise. We don't need like full Earth gravity or anything like that. It doesn't simulate full Earth gravity, but it simulates a higher gravity than we strictly need. I wish I could slow that down a bit. But anyway, here I'm building the rest of the station. That's only for them to exercise in. They're not going to live in that spinning portion because uh, uh, it's actually spinning a little bit quickly. It'll have tidal forces and be a little bit uncomfortable. As long as you're exercising it, it's probably all right. Uh, if you're not staying in there for too long. So I add solar panels on these uh, infernal robotics parts and I wanted to extend them beyond the centrifuge just for just for the sake of doing so really. I don't think it's strictly necessary. If we orient this north-south uh, they won't ever actually be blocked by the centrifuge but it's nice to have them on those arms anyway. So that's what I do. And we're going to launch this on SLS so this is also a chance for me to test my SLS build which is very accurate in terms of empty weight and the fuel mass and all that. Burn times are correct. All that is correct. I even tried to shape the the stage here, which is the the exploration upper stage on the SLS Block 1B. So this is a SLS Block 1B we're using to launch it. And uh, so I've tried to mimic it as closely as possible. I use uh, the utilization of the tanks to size them appropriately. And those are for RL10Cs, and at the bottom we have RS25D slash Es. Okay, and uh, solid rocket boosters are five segment boosters with the appropriate uh, criteria, the appropriate mass, and the appropriate thrust. So, yeah, I'm even changing the texture of the tank because apparently NASA is going with orange now, so I, I went with orange. And we are going to launch from Cape Canaveral. Now, I want this station to also be able to work with the moon, so I did time us to the minimal relative inclination with the moon, and that's why we're launching at night again. And here it goes again. The video is sped up uh, to match real time. It was much, much slower the way uh, we had to watch it during the stream, but this is nice too. I'm glad we can watch it like this too. Okay, and uh, the boosters, we keep them until about 2 minutes and 3 seconds, at which point they should be at around 400 kilonewtons of thrust. They sort of taper out and they end up having very low thrust for a fairly long period of time like the real space shuttle rocket bo the boosters did. And so we'll have to separate them before they're strictly completely spent. And so you'll see me mouse over them and check what their thrust is, and I'll separate them when they're at 400 kilonewtons. Okay, there we go. Separation. And again, apologies that we don't have all the sound here, but it's sort of a trade-off. Okay, after that, it's a long trip to orbit with this. The Block 1B is not the fastest thing to get to orbit. The Actually, the Space Shuttle main engine stage with these four SSMEs is not too bad. It's the, it's the upper stage, the, the exploration upper stage, which is a very long stage, and this stage right here is not meant to get all the way to orbit. This is meant to get short of orbit, and then the exploration upper stage completes orbit. And it takes a long time to do that. But anyway, here we go. The main core stage is supposed to separate, but I've got a issue here. I've never, I don't remember seeing this before, at least not for a long time. The inner stage is not decoupling properly. I decided to dump the fairing first to see if that gives it some kick or some rotation. 
the RL10s are burning inside the fairing. Well, not now, because without acceleration, the fuel ended up not being fit into the engines properly, so you see them cut out there. Thankfully, they do have relights. They have 10 relights altogether. Somebody suggested using time warp, and that did free the second stage. And so that's what we did. It could have ended in disaster, but it turned out all right. So uh, here we go. We've lit the second stage again using the Ullage rockets. And we are going to reorient with the help of RCS as well. And uh, here we go. Turning back to prograde. Now the target apoapsis and periapsis for this station is about 400 kilometers, which is on par with the International Space Station. You can see that I've put a lot of food, water, and oxygen on board. The, it doesn't need to be replenished very frequently, but it still does need to be replenished if you're going to have Kerbals on there for an extended period of time. Okay, so here we go. Slowly chugging on our way to orbit. Very low acceleration you see there, 2.8 meters per second squared. The full length of the stage is 18 minutes and 45 seconds, by the way. And it is meant to be able to transfer stuff to Mars. That's what it's for. It doesn't do that very quickly, but it does have a lot of delta V. And in fact, it has too much delta V for this purpose, so we will deorbit this. I did put a controller on so that we could deorbit the, the exploration upper stage. We're not got complete orbit here. The station itself has little thrusters, so it'll use those to to actually boost itself the extra 100 kilometers. Okay, so the main engines, the RL-10s are out and we separate and I switch back to the station, give it a little bit of a boost and now we're in uh, one to one time, I'm no longer time accelerating the video. Okay, extending the solar panel arms There we go, and then extending the solar panels once those arms are out. Grand deployment of this, uh, sort of the first module of our station though. I have to say, a realism overhaul resizes the docking ports so that they're all two meters. And so it doesn't give me a very happy feeling about how we dock things together. I don't know if they're very, it's very solid you know, docking mechanism and how big we can make stations without it wiggling apart or anything. We might we might test that. That might be something to come up. But anyway, this station right now is going to test whether we can keep Kerbals fit for an extended period of time to get them to other planets. And also it's gonna test where I can dock the Dragon version 2 properly because I've sort of put the docking port on that uh, a little bit awkwardly. I need to see that that works out. Here I'm deorbiting the second stage. So yeah, uh, that, so that's a very purposeful little uh, station that we've got there. And we will be doing lunar activities to test out in situ resource utilization. So we'll be doing that aspect of it at the moon. I don't necessarily say that NASA has to do that in real life, but I'd like to do that, test it out before we send the ISR units to Mars or beyond. Okay, here we go, retro burning. And you see, it's got a lot of fuel, really. We, we, we're we a bit wasteful in the sandbox mode. We'll try not to be in the future, but but we do have our set launchers, so that's the thing. Okay, that's definitely deorbited. So here we are with our station. And we're going to boost it up to uh, over 400 by 400 is my target. There is Australia there whizzing by. So I'm just going to do a few more maneuvers with the station here to get it into the orientation and orbit that I want. And that did it for the stream. So, yep, if you'd like to join me during the live streams, it'll be on Sunday. Uh, it'll be 11 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, so once we get out of... Uh, daylight savings is going to be a little bit different, but uh, around uh, 6 p.m. GMT, and that's while, when I'll be streaming all of this stuff, and we'll have music and, of course, the actual game audio. Uh, unfortunately, for YouTube videos, I'll continue just doing post-commentary, but I'll keep the videos short, 
so that's a plus side. Tell me what you think about the format, and uh, if you have any ideas about what I should do, uh, take a look at the mods, but uh, probably I'll be focused on the ideas presented during the live stream, so keep that in mind. Alright, so uh, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this video, if you did enjoy this video please do press like, if you have any comments or suggestions please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.